All right, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. Um, thank you for being here, especially like to thank the staff for putting this together and taking time out of their really busy schedule to uh, give this presentation to the developers and we'd really like to get the input of the developers here. Uh, today we're going to talk about the online mapping service. Uh, Sean Southern will present that. Uh, compatib compatibility analysis by Wayne Dice and Buford King. We're going to go over the changes proposed to the low impact development. Uh, subdivision bonds and sidewalks, uh, Richard Johnson will present that. Uh, Richard Peterson will talk about some changes with the utilities and infrastructure. And then finally, construction standards by Richard Johnson. Um, the, I tell you, the staff has done a fantastic job coming in, looking at the subdivision regs and the different building ordinances and making changes where changes need to be done. Uh, we'd love to get your input on that. Uh, one thing that they're really trying to do that is really nice today, you know, that this job gets harder and harder the more social media uh, gets a, a larger presence. And one thing that they're really trying to do is trying to get this as, as much as possible, the decisions made more objectively than subjectively. That's difficult to do and you can only get it so far. But I think you'll see through a lot of these changes that are being made, uh, such as the density calculations, that we're trying to get more and more objective wherever we can. But I certainly thank you for being here. And any questions you have, the staff will be certain to, to listen to the questions and, be, and value your input. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lee. Um, my name is Wayne Dice. I'm the planning director here in Fairhope. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we hope this is a, we'll have a good exchange of comments and questions and ideas. Um, as Lee mentioned, this is a way for us to sort of communicate to the, uh, to the public and the development community and others about what we're thinking about, what we're proposing, some of our current practices. So we're very excited about that. Um, what we're going to do is we have six topics to discuss. Uh, the presenter will present and then we'll take questions after the presentation is finished after each one of these topics. So we'll, we'll present, take questions on that topic and then move to the next presenter and then take questions after that one. That that's, will be the format today. The first item is the online mapping service. We're very happy to have the ability to show uh, the City of Fairhope zoning map online 24-7. Um, now anybody can look at the zoning of their property or any properties within the city uh, anytime they want to. I think this is a, will be a very beneficial tool to the public as well as the staff. And uh, we're lucky to have uh, Mr. Sean Southern uh, from Keat Consulting Service who prepared the map viewer for us. And Sean will come up and give a, just a brief overview of the service, how it works, and, and all the things you need to know about the mapping tool. So Sean? All right, th uh, thank you very much, Wayne. Um, so uh, as you see on screen here, uh, we have the City of Fairhope's website. Uh, and uh, a little bit further down here, we have a link uh, to the map viewer. Uh, so once you click on the link, uh, it opens up another tab, which is actually going to be the launching point for all the various maps and applications that the city is going to be releasing as uh, some of the information is verified and, and uh, ready for public use. Um, there's, I know of uh, a few other applications at this point that are getting close to being uh, released uh, in addition to the one that's already available. Uh, so from this uh, GIS gallery site, uh, you'll have um, access to the various applications. Uh, right now, uh, we have the viewer, so we click on it, it's gonna open up a, another tab uh, and display some uh, current information here as to, uh, and we can close this. Uh, but this is basically the prompting that says what this map is intended for, and if there's any information that uh, is required, uh, you, this is who you call uh, to get confirmation. Uh, you do have to agree that you, you know, whether you read it or not, you agree that you have read it, um, and then you click OK, and then you have access to the application. Uh, so when it initially launches here, uh, this application, let me step back for a second. This application uh, is a uh, multi-platform, uh, uh, and by that I mean it will work on a browser of any 
on any device, whether it's uh, your laptop, your desktop computer, you know, a tablet, uh, or your phone. Of course, with each, each of those devices, uh, it is using a code base that is smart to know what kind of device you're on uh, as far as, you know, real estate or, or screen size. So as you get to the smaller platforms like your phone, um, there's a lot that will change in the look and feel, but it's still the same data and still the same capabilities. Um, so the actual uh, site here, uh, if you actually went to the public or the, uh, the city's webpage and clicked on it in your phone your browser, it would open up what roughly that you see here. Uh, so it does work in all platforms. Uh, so from the standpoint of what we're first seeing is just an overview of zoomed out to a level uh, that covers uh, the city. Uh, and, you know, everything in here is clickable as far as uh, if you perform an action to actually tap uh, or click on a particular zoning area, you're going to get a pop-up. Uh, and depending on how far out you are, uh, you may get one to 20 uh, various, uh, well, various information here. And, and some of what you're seeing here on the screen is, um, is, is more of what you would see in more of a, a, a mobile platform. Uh, the size of the laptop that, I'm, that we're using right now, it is sensing it as something that's a little bit more, uh, I guess, of a smaller resolution of screen size. Uh, I'm going to zoom in and see if I can get it to act a little bit more like a desktop here. Uh, all right, so it's still going to, uh, you know, uh, emulate uh, more of a smaller platform as far as the screen size. So with that, you're going to get this pop-up, which actually tells you uh, that it is a zoning classification uh, for this particular parcel area, um, and with it, if you click on the uh, side arrow, you actually get what the um, classification is, which is R2. Um, but if you zoom in further, you're going to have other things turn on uh, as you get closer into the map. Uh, you're going to have uh, information as annotation and labeling uh, are going to turn on. And one thing uh, that we do as far as a uh, service for the county. Uh, Baldwin County is one of our clients as far as from the revenue department side uh, and there was uh, agreements and communication between the City of Fairhope and Baldwin County um, that the City of Fairhope has permission to utilize the parcel data that we upkeep uh, on a monthly basis. So the annotation that you're seeing here uh, is the exact same kind of annotation that we uh, are utilizing uh, for the county. So there's actually a one-to-one uh, -one, uh, relationship here. And so when you click on parcel and you're looking at information, you're getting a subset, not everything that the county is currently hosting, but a subset of information here that will help kind of give you a clue about um, more so uh, what, what the deal is with the, with the parcel data. Uh, this application uh, has several different functions that can be done by key uh, or by button actions. Um, the uh, left-hand side here, uh, you've got zoom in and zoom out capabilities as well as your default home extent. Uh, there's also a ability to do or utilize location. So if you are using this on your phone, it will use your GPS on your phone uh, to give you a position of where you are uh, within the city. Um, You've got uh, capability to enter in a address. Uh, so if there is a development or an area or an address that you have, you can key it in. And this is using the Esri database, uh, which is a nationwide database. Uh, so it will get and or point you to you know, a road range address uh, that will get you close to what the you know what you're looking for and then you can rely on uh, the data that is the city's data that that is available at the site 
Um, there's uh, widgets, uh, which are here at the bottom, there's a, an ability if we, let's zoom in to another area here. So if you're wanting to uh, get rough measurements, uh, either linear measurements or area measurements, uh, you can utilize this tool here. And I'm gonna end up clicking on uh, the button for the area measurement, clicking to you know start to roughly sketch out maybe what it would be a combined parcel here. And uh, like I said, all the information on the site anyway is, is just that, it's for just rough uh, estimates. Uh, so once you click around what uh, area you wanna um, calculate, it, it performs the uh, acreage uh, by default uh, and that's roughly 1.69 acres, or you can, you know, interactively change it to uh, another measurement type, and it immediately performs uh, the conversion for you. Uh, you can also do this with linear measurement tool. So you're wanting to just get uh, maybe one side to know roughly a distance. You know, that's roughly about 400 feet. Um, and it also can be converted on, on the fly uh, to like miles or some other uh, statute. Um, you can also get a GPS location. Uh, if you wanted to just uh, hover the mouse in and around an area, uh, you're getting a latitude longitude and it is changing as I'm scrolling around. Or uh, you can actually click and drop a point and then that's static at that point. So you could, if you needed a latitude longitude for some reason, or you could change it to degrees, minutes, seconds, and uh, utilize that function. So that's the uh, measurement widget. There's a ability to perform a query, and this query is against uh, both the city's data and the county's data. Uh, so if you're looking for uh, zoning classifications that fit a uh, certain category and you're wanting to see uh, you know where all those are uh, if we do it on this R1 low density family and then we execute the query it's going to go out into the database and actually pull back you know all the information that uh, represents R1 and uh, it is going to take it a second because I think uh, it's somewhere in the rough range of about 2,300 properties. Uh, and all of them are highlighted in this uh, green color. Uh, but each of these are clickable and you can zoom around uh, within the map uh, to see these various uh, parcels uh, that represent a particular zone. Uh, and then if you want to also continue to interact with the map, you can click uh, and get uh, actually more information here uh, as to what particular parcel, who's the owner of that parcel. Uh, so there's uh, functions here that, that intermingle that you can use uh, to interact with the map. Uh, there is also ability to uh, click on the, this, the three uh, horizontal dots here to get more information as to even opening it up into uh, an attribute table at the bottom. Uh, and so this, this is giving you a little bit more information just in a uh, tabular sense. Uh, but it also is something that you can interact with to click and uh, it's gonna highlight the information and show you uh, what you got around in the map. Okay, so there is also a print function. And uh, within this print function, uh, you can actually manipulate this map title. Uh, and it can be anything that you desire it to be. You can uh, change the layout to where if you want it in a particular um, format. Uh, right now it defaults to letter uh, landscape. 
uh, but you could make it map only if you just wanted the map information and not any kind of um, format uh, specific. But if we leave it in letter, you can also change uh, the output type. Right now it's, it's going to be a PDF, uh, but you could change it to uh, one of these other uh, imagery types like a JPEG or a GIF. Uh, we're going to leave it in that. And then there's actually advanced capability if you're wanting to re preserve uh, the map extent area or the map scale or put in um, you know, your name as the author. Um, you can change the print quality uh, to increase the DPI, uh, but if we leave this all the same, what it's going to end up doing is creating a, a link that you can click on uh, that is a PDF map, uh, which will include uh, the legend of what is actually the map data in this area. And then once it's done, you can click on it and it's going to open it up into a different tab and then we've got basically our map that we now could look at and review. You know, it pre-populates it uh, with uh, a scale and a uh, legend and uh, some other ancillary information about supporting documentation. Uh, but if you wanted to save this so you could actually print it, uh, you would click on a, a download capability and actually download it and change the name here and then save it. Um, so I'm going to close that now. And uh, this will keep up with a multitude of, of prints uh, until such time that you actually clear them out of the memory. Uh, so this next widget is called the uh, share widget. Uh, it affords the user the capability to uh, send this particular extent, uh, but via email uh, to whomever you, you would desire, and it would actually send them uh, the link, and uh, whenever they clicked on this, it would zoom them in to this particular area. Uh, so if you had something that you wanted to highlight to someone, uh, you could, uh, even before doing this, uh, you could uh, uh, do a few other things in the map and then click on the share widget and uh, uh, end up email, emailing it to, you know, a, uh, a potential person that you want to review something. Now on the uh, main title bar up here, um, we've got a link here that takes you back to the City of Fairhope's website. Um, but as far as widgets go, we've got a widget called the Select Widget. Uh, this can be used to uh, highlight uh, and or select a multitude of, right now, it's got uh, ability to, for anything that is checked and uh, not gray at this moment. Uh, some of what you could probably see on screen, you can't see what is, is uh, bold or uh, uh, grayed out. But if it has a check by it, it means that it will be considered as part of the selection. I'm going to uncheck the county uh, polygon because that basically is everything. And I'm also going to zoom back out here to our extent and zoom in a little bit. And let's say that I'm just working in this area right in here and I just want to get some information about about all the uh, data that's like in that area. So just dragging across, I've, I do have the capability to select by rectangle as the default or I could click and select by a polygon which I can interactively uh, go around a subdivision if you need to and uh, it would select all the uh, zoning classifications in that subdivision or and also the parcel data that's represented in that area. Uh, so now all that information that I've already have selected and highlighted here, I'm going to do it one more time here. Um, that is represented here. So I've got 328 total count um, of zones here and I can bring this up in the attribute table at the bottom. And uh, this, this is everything that's been selected. So I could click on those and then 
end up looking at uh, each of these individually at that point. Uh, All right, so let's, uh, let's go on to uh, a little bit more interactive tool for a buffering uh, uh, capability here uh, and also selection. Uh, this is called the Enhanced Search widget. Uh, it's going to allow for uh, a multitude of things that, that I think uh, uh, is going to be shown in a little bit greater detail here later. Uh, I wanted to just give you some highlights here. Uh, this uh, has abilities to buffer. Uh, and right now it's set at a thousand feet, um, but that also could be modified to be miles or meters. Uh, you can do it by a uh, polygon or a line uh, as far as drawing or just by a point. You know, so if you had a particular property that you're wanting to know information a thousand feet out buffer from that as far as all zones in within a thousand feet of that particular property, um, this is what would uh, tell you there's 90 and uh, you can scroll down through here and see all the different zone classifications and just, just so happens this is all still in a uh, low density single family uh, R1 classification. Uh, there's capability to do um, like sub results or add to the, the current results so you could do remove or add to from these selections. So if you're wanting to refine something, uh, there's ability to be able to do uh, further um, uh, searching within something that's already been searched. And then there's ability to clear both the buffer and uh, clear anything else with the concerning doing the search if you're done. Uh, the next capability here uh, as far as a widget is the draw widget. Uh, this is in essence a sketching capability so it's nothing that is actually uh, like changing anything with the map itself or the data. Uh, it's just for this environment for your uh, needs uh, on the device or computer that you're working on. Uh, so I could go in here and say that I need to just freehand uh, to highlight a particular subdivision or an area. At here, I've got a chance to maybe change the color uh, to something different, uh, change where it's a little bit more transparency, the transparency, even change the outline width, or even have it where it shows the measurement uh, and show it in acres. Um, so with this, I can, let me actually, just do a square. So I'm going to get this whole somewhat block area here. So quickly I'm able to estimate that this is about 18 acres. Um, and then I could actually add in my own text. Change the uh, color to something lacking here um, there there should be a small little dot and I can't see it within the application here all right we'll uh, just pretend that I can can't get it to work uh, so with a mouse <laughs> instead of just a touchpad um, and I think maybe it's the screen size that's uh, affecting it somewhat. But uh, you can change the color of the font uh, to be something different. Uh, right now, I think I'll have to go on here. Um, and I think, yeah, there's my uh, test area. I know it's in, in white. It's hard to, hard to tell what that is. but. Um, you have the ability to see all this information and be able to control it and create your own kind of map on top of the map. 
uh, and if you end up going back and doing a print, it actually captures this information in the drawing that you did. So it's an ability to draw your own uh, map on top or areas and such on the map and then create a, uh, uh, a PDF of it or a JPEG. And there's the uh, test area in the, so if you're more, uh, I guess, the more that you use it, the more proficient that you'll be able uh, to create some content for yourself. All right, and so the rest of these are uh, things that just, you know, <coughs> allow you to see the legend, uh, everything that's being drawn at the moment. Uh, you've got your various zoning classifications that you can clearly see what color represents uh, what zoning. You have uh, your layer widget, which allows you to turn on and off various data because uh, there's things that aren't inherently turned on, uh, but you can go in here and uh, there's a medical district layer that you can turn on, uh, police jurisdiction, permit, and with each of these, once they're turned on, when you click it within the map, you get, uh, of course, information that is on that, on that data that you can, uh, um, you know, end up seeing the, the detailed pop-up information for it. One of the other capabilities you can do is uh, bookmark. Uh, so if this area is of concern to you, you can create your own bookmarks and these stay with your device. Like, so if it's your laptop computer, it'll stay on your computer until you delete it out. Uh, it's not saved for other people to be able to see, it's just within your own sandbox. <coughs> so now if I zip back out to the main area here and then I go back to my bookmark, It, it takes me exactly back to where the extent I was. And then this last uh, widget is the base map gallery. Uh, there's data here uh, that's hosted by Esri, uh, this imagery data, uh, street space map layer, but then there's also Baldwin County's imagery, uh, which is from the revenue department, and then uh, the uh, this is the default imagery or the default base map that comes with the uh, City of Fairhope's website. So I could switch over to where I'm seeing the Baldwin County data here. And it's the exact same imagery that's hosted on the county's uh, website because we host that as well. So you've got some options here for uh, changing that up to kind of fit the need of what you might be wanting to uh, do uh, when it comes to using the map data. And then we just have a information widget here about that just tells us at what stage of um, development this is. Uh, this is utilizing what's called Web App Builder uh, and we uh, interface with Esri and create this. Uh, so that uh, we can have something stable uh, that can be used uh, and then we'll do updates but you won't have to do anything other than remember that gallery that we talked about at the very beginning um, and that will essentially will when we change or update the code you still go to the same place you'll just you're going to benefit from not having to uh, do anything to um, to, to the application itself. It will be updated for you. Um, the layers that you're seeing now, those are in the, uh, the layer widget. Mm -hmm. Showing your plan jurisdiction, your permitting jurisdiction, your place jurisdiction. That they check respectively. Yes. And you can zoom out and they can see that. Uh, 
That's correct, yeah. The, so the various things I turned on, uh, now if I go back to my legend here, you're gonna see police jurisdiction is orange with the blue, uh, planning is uh, the green on green, and permit is, is basically this uh, you know, light red color. But uh, I think for the most part, this you know, kind of gives you guys a, a quick overview of the application. I know we gotta move on. Um, but uh, there will be components of this that you'll see here in this next presentation. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Are, are there any questions for Sean about the map viewer? If so, we need to you to come to the microphone, please. This is being recorded. We need to make sure we get everybody so we can hear them. Cooper Norman. Uh, nice work. In your query categories, do you have one for the historic districts in town? I don't think so at this point. At this point, we do not. We are, this is being continually built upon. Uh, this, this is this, the initial first stages with the zoning layers and the police jurisdiction. But as we move forward, we'll be adding to our data catalog for this. And that's something we'll definitely look at. Uh, we're doing research on that right now and working with the, uh, with the committee uh, with that. And, but it's something we'll definitely be looking at putting on here. Thank you. Replats, um, or when we get people submit a replat, they we require an aerial with topo information, and it looks like now they can produce that off of this. It's yeah, that, I mean, I, this would be certainly be acceptable. This is straight from the, like I said, the different imagery is from the county and also from, I uh, suppose, Google imagery. It is Google. I was just curious if it would generate a like an adjacent property owners list, something like that. That's typically necessary for zoning. Submittals, kind of yeah, through the various tools uh, for selection and buffering, you'll be able to do that uh, because you could just buffer out from drawing around the property and say buffer 10 feet, and then you'd get all the adjacent properties. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. And as we said a minute ago, as, as we go forward with this, with this um, tool, we'll be adding to it, adding more information to it. Uh, and we hope to make it uh, so all the information you'll, you'll need from a mapping perspective will be available to you 24-7 without the need to come down to City Hall or Public Works. We want to make it available at your fingertips for that. So we, I think, uh, Sean, thank you for coming. We appreciate that. We're going to move now into sort of the staff, uh, staff um, presentations on the various topics. Before I get started, I, I, I want to make recognize, uh, I know Lee Turner spoke a minute ago, also Holly McAlair is here from the Planning Commission. Um, also, uh, we got David Powell from GIS, and uh, thank you, David. Nancy Milford, one of our planners, and also Emily Boyett in the back. And, um, you know, and, and Mr. Johnson, see, I'm sorry, I didn't see Mr. Johnson. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate that. Um, the next item we're going to go into is the compatibility analysis. This is something that, um, as we said at the last planning commission, this, this analysis is not a rule, it's not an ordinance, it's just a good planning practice that we have employed to help us analyze rezonings, PUDs, and site plan approvals. Again, this is just part of the staff recommendations, not a rule, not an ordinance, but we are, are using this to try to help remove some of the subjectivity from zoning. Many times we hear that zoning is very subjective, um, but we want to start putting some data and some quantitative facts uh, with some of these rezonings and, uh, and some of these uh, processes we use so at least when we make a recommendation to the Planning Commission or the City Council, we are doing so with some facts and some data that help support our position. Uh, it's not merely we don't like it or we like it, it's gonna be based on facts and data. So we're very, we've been working very hard with this. This is not a new process. I borrowed this from another place that I have, uh, I have been uh, and it worked well and so we're, we are fine tuning this. Um, this uh, will, be, will be used like I said, for each and every rezoning and, and every application we have that, that deals with site plans or PUDs. I'm gonna ask Buford King, one of our planners, to come up, and Buford uh, does the analysis for this. Um, it's heavily GIS-based, but we can use our map viewer for that as well. But I'm gonna ask Buford to come up and kind of give you a, an overview of the compatibility analysis, uh, how, what it's used for, and how you do it. So Buford. So good afternoon, everyone. If you'll indulge me a moment and allow me to open my slideshow. We will begin.
Okay, good afternoon. As Wayne was saying, we'll discuss the compatibility, compatibility analysis. And the, it's a great segue into this topic, having seen the map viewer demonstration first, because what you'll see are some of the same elements repeated in the slides that are forthcoming. And so when we talk about compatibility, we're going to determine what do we look at, where do we look at it. Using one of the widgets that you saw previously in Sean's demonstration, we have the ability, as you saw, to draw a buffer. So in this example and on this slide, and I apologize if it's a bit dark, I'm looking at it from an angle here. What we did here is chose the City Hall property, the property on which City Hall is located, and used the KCS map viewer to draw a buffer at 1,320 feet, which is one quarter mile. And I added one of the web links for the map viewer as well. And in addition, as you see in the, in the snippet from the city website right there, if you go to the planning and zoning page, you can see it's also included there right in the list of menu items. You click there, it opens up the map viewer just as you saw previously. So in this example, we have the buffer drawn around the city hall property. What I wanted to demonstrate here is, as you saw in Sean's presentation earlier, is that you can use the measurement tools <coughs> to then determine the measurement of that area. So the total area of that, the total area of this, uh, the total area of this map is about 177 acres. And it measures that directly and it will do it in acres, it will do it in hectares, it will do it in square meters, the various dimensions. So when we're making a compatibility analysis, and again, like Wayne was saying, this is a methodology, a staff level methodology, we'll settle upon approximately one quarter mile. Within that buffer area, we'll begin to evaluate the properties that fall within that buffer area for compatibility with the uh, submitted development. So I chose this area as just an example. And you'll hear us use two phrases, adjacent area, which is exactly as it describes properties adjacent to the subject property, but also the surrounding neighborhood, which are the other areas within that quarter mile buffer. So let's jump into the density portion. We're going to look at density first. We'll finish with some different criteria. What do we do with this area within this buffer? Well, what we're looking for are actual and allowable densities within that buffer. So for example, right here, if we assume this neighborhood is 2.75 acres total and has 11 lots, we'll do a very simple density calculation of 11 lots divided by 2.75 acres to give you four units per acre of actual density, the density that is there on the ground right now. When we're looking through these buffer areas, we'll find approved plats, recorded plats of subdivisions to the maximum extent practical because those are lots of record where their density is a part of the public record. We'll use those to the maximum extent practical. Where there's not, we just simply will use the various, but we use the various measurement tools you saw earlier to get the acreage and then count the number of lots. So you've seen actual density, what's there on the ground. In addition to that, you have an allowable density. And so, for example, let's assume that neighborhood is zoned R2, which requires 10,500 square foot lot sizes. And of course, one acre is 43,560 square feet. So if we divide the 10,500 square feet minimum lot size by 43,560 square feet, we end up, we end up with 4.15 units per acre allowable. Now that, of course, ignores rights of way, open space, et cetera, but that's a raw allowable figure. We look at both. Okay, moving on, again, using some more of the map viewer tools. We're going to look at what falls just within the buffer, and I chose this example because if you look in the lower right-hand corner of the photo, the buffer cuts off a part of one of the lots. So that area, using the measurement tool, and you notice that as I measured it, as I digitized it, it actually, it defaults to a green color, which I left in there for example purposes. So we calculated that physically 2.7 acres falls within the buffer area, calculated by the KCS map here as you see right there. So then we're going to come up with a weighted unit 
for that neighborhood based upon the actual acreage within the buffer. So as you saw earlier, its actual development density is four units per acre times 2.7 acres inside the buffer for the 10.8 units. Now these are raw units. We'll explain the final calculation in a, in a, free, in a future slide. Then the 4.15 units per acre allowable times the 2.7 acres for 11.21 units allowable. And again, the strictly units. You'll continue that process for all of the properties within the buffer, whether they're adjacent or whether they're surrounding. Uh, here, let's describe, well, what about unzoned properties? Well, the City of Fairhope's subdivision regulations require that if City of Fairhope staff is evaluating a subdivision request in its ETJ that's unzoned, those lots must be 15,000 square feet and must be 100 feet wide. Using the same simple calculation of dividing one acre by the minimum lot size, that yields you 2.9 units per acre allowable for an unzoned property. Coincidentally, that is also the allowable units per acre development density if an area is zoned City of Fairhope R1. We do examine the properties very carefully, however, we utilize actual density to the maximum extent practical. Obviously, if you have a lot that appear that is very, very, very apparent that it has one unit per acre, then we default to the 2.9 units per acre allowable. But I included this photo right here. This is in, this is unzoned property, but it is in Fairhope's ETJ. And physically counting this in the field, that's 21 units. So if we encounter that, when we encounter that, making this, uh, making this uh, evaluation, we will reflect what's actual in the field. That's 21 units per acre if that fell within a buffer that we were evaluating. So the process described previously is repeated for all the areas, as we talked about, within the buffer. We look at the various zoning districts, unzoned properties, established subdivisions. Now, suppose the total, uh, without going through a line by line, very lengthy calculation, I'll give you a, we'll summarize here. Suppose you had a total actual weighted unit count in the previous example buffer is 520 units. And it includes, which includes say the 10.8 units that we calculated, 10 point units that we calculated previously. So the weighted average for the entire buffer is then divided by the total acreage of the buffer less the subject property. So the city hall property, 3.44 acres. If you had 520 units, as an example, the 177 acres of the total buffer less the subject property, that gives you three units per acre actual density. Very similarly, suppose your allowable weighted unit count was 580 units. Same calculation. We know that we have 11.21 units that's included inside there. Same calculation, but we have a larger number because it reflects allowable development densities. So if we take that 580 units, divide it by the same figure as previously, now you have 3.34 units per acre allowable. The average of the two, the 3.34 and the 3.0, gives you a total, or gives you a, a final average, of 3.17 units per acre. We'll compare that to the requested density proposed by the developer. In addition, in addition to the series of calculations. But what you'll notice here, and alluding to Wayne's statements earlier, those are re reproducible numbers that everyone in the community with internet access may reproduce using now this publicly available map viewer. So what you're able to do is you're able to utilize the computing power of ArcGIS with your web browser. So additional criteria. The dwelling type and housing type in both adjacent and surrounding neighborhood. Uh, that would be expressed as a percentage of housing types per area. And this is criteria, again, Wayne helped us develop this using his experience. Building orientation of the adjacent areas is another criteria we'd evaluate. The building setbacks in the adjacent areas. The building height in the adjacent areas. The lot width and lot length in the adjacent areas. Uh, the development intensity for commercial areas. So the parking orientation, entrance orientation, loading areas, hours of operation, average impervious surface ratio. Also, the proximity, what we have in Fairhope with village centers, the proximity to village centers where a higher density or intensity would be allowable. So we make this statement to say that 
yes, we do a lot of raw calculations of physical, of, of what's physically existing in the field, but we don't evaluate that in a vacuum. So we'll conclude this with, I'll give you an example of a recent, of a recent application. And we'll, I'll just verbalize it for you. So we, we had the opportunity to evaluate a development that was requested was approximately four units per acre. After we evaluated the adjacent areas and surrounding neighborhood using the process we described previously, we calculated that the final average was 2.5 units per acre. After working with the developer and the applicant and their engineer of record, we received a revised density request of approximately 3.2 units per acre. However, they included within the components of that 3.2 units per acre density, which is still higher than what is existing in the field, the average between the allowable and the actual, but they included areas of identical compatibility. So for example, they had a street passing by the development. The lots across the street from the proposed development, they matched the, the lot width identically. So they created a 100% compatible corridor fronting the road on which it was located. In addition to that, they progressively increased the density toward the development center. So for example, some of the outer, the outer perimeter lots became 75 feet wide. The inner lots were as narrow as 50 feet wide. So they went progressively from 100% compatibility to increasing density to the center. But we did not evaluate that in a vacuum. They had vegetative buffer that was going to remain and a variety of other, variety of other functions there that applied to the situation. So we say that to make this point is that we'll utilize the hard numbers collected in the field. The same numbers can be replicated by the applicant and the general public using the map viewer. But then we'll evaluate that alongside all the other criteria we explained previously when we're evaluating a zoning change or a zoning type of case. And then, Wayne, I'll be happy to turn it over for questions. Let me add, too, again, this is a tool for us to use. I mean, obviously, right now, the Fairhope Comfort Plan has these village centers um, throughout uh, key intersections, throughout uh, Fairhope and the uh, exterior jurisdictions. Obviously, at those village centers, we anticipate, and the city has, has uh, shown their vision, they want those areas to, to be developed more intensely. And obviously, if you have a development, the closer you get to the village center, the more intensity you're going to have in order to help that village center be viable. And so that's something that, that will also be uh, figured in to, this, to these uh, equations of, of compatibility. But again, the whole goal of this is to, to ensure that, that you have developments that complement one another. Um, not a development that's going to adversely affect anybody else, but they'll be complementary, and we feel like this, uh, this process will lead to that. We'll have complementary developments. Now, as you may have read, as we go forward, we'll be uh, in, going through a new comprehensive plan. Uh, we feel like it will be very detailed, and the new comprehensive plan uh, we will sort of marry together a lot of different factors in development with that. With a new comprehensive plan, you'll be uh, it will include utilities, the evaluation of utilities as far as where uh, growth occurs, and so uh, the, the utilities can match the growth and where where we anticipate the high growth areas. I would envision uh, a this, this land use plan to incorporate that so the city can maximize the utility infrastructure in these areas by, by providing a higher level of utilities to more uh, developed and intense areas and so forth. It'll consider uh, the compatibility of the environmental features of the, of the land as far as wetlands and things of that nature. So the, as we go forward, you'll see this be modified a little bit as we, as we um, again, endeavor on this task to create a, a plan that will be all inclusive, I believe, and will really provide a very clear direction and roadmap for, uh, for Fair Oaks development in the next 20 to 25 years. We're excited about that. Um, and it will, like, like I said before, it will include a lot of different factors. It won't be just a land use plan. It will be a, a, a mix of land use, transportation will be uh, a critical component of that and all, the, all, and all those kind of factors. Uh, and so we're excited about that. With that, we'll take any questions you might have about this. Be glad to answer any. If you come, please come to the podium, of uh, the microphone. Thank you. Uh, John A. Vent with Dewberry Engineering. Um, we sent a example of a ex-territorial subdivision to Buford 
and he came back and what he had, uh, showed here that basically you got to do 15,000 square foot lots, 100 by 150. The and I understand that's the regulation, but in order to get to the subject property we're looking at, you had to go through a hundred and something lot subdivision that had 10,500 foot square lots and it's not in the zoned area. So what's going to happen the way it appears by the regulation and you can't wait anything out because it's not zoned property that from now on all we're going to have throughout Fairhope unless you hit a, a village center is a, we don't have nothing but 100 by 150 foot lots or greater. And there's no other mechanism to get to achieve anything less than that. Well, let me, let me, let me say this. It, it, this only applies to the zoned areas of Fairhope. So if you're an unincorporated Baldwin County in the planning jurisdiction, this would not apply. This would only apply again to PUDs, rezonings, and also site plan approvals. Uh, that's correct. But then again, what I'm trying to get towards you in a county but it's unzoned property so and we got thousands of acres out there so right. we'll have thousands of acres of a hundred and a hundred by hundred by 150 foot lots because it's own zone property and Fairhope has it within their wheelhouse to require this and but there's no no imagination, no creativity, no planned unit developments, not, nothing but 150, you know, 15,000 square foot uh, lots. And what I'm asking for, some kind of, I know what the rules are rules, but we need to create something if, if that's going to be imposed that someone else could come in there for whatever reason and be more creative on these developments instead of doing a grid, 115,000 square foot right. lots. And, and, and John, as, and I'll let Buford chime in too, right now in the extraterritorial jurisdiction, you have to have, this has been, the, the sub regs have been in place for quite a while. You have to have 100 foot wide lots and fit a minimum of 15,000 square foot That's lots. That's just been changed for, in the last year. That, ha that has not changed. That has been in the rules since I've been here. No. Well, yes, and I, and I don't know how long it's been I can been probably here, show you when it changed. It's, it's been changed by the city council. It used to be 75, well, 75 right. feet, 10,500. Right. I know. And in the recent, but it, yeah. that's my point. Is My point is there's no vision outside the city of Fairhope. There's no creativity on on anything but gridded 15,000 square foot lots. Thank you, John. And, and let me go back. I can tell you from my time here, starting February of 16, I guess it was, that, and Lee making it shed some land on this, that 100 foot lot width and 15,000 square foot is in the, is in the sub regs, and we have not changed in my time. We've not changed that at all. That change was about roughly four years ago because okay. it used to be lots were allowed to be smaller out in the ETJ than they were inside the city limits that just was counterintuitive. But John, one thing, they're talking about the average size of the lots. And like if somebody was bringing a put in in the ETJ that was contiguous, that would be the average, the average size of the lot would need to be, they're talking about the average density, not that every single lot would have to be that size in a put itself, it would have to average out to that. If you're not in a, in, in a put, isn't that right? Then in a put, well, you, you're <clears throat> looking at having that many lots average out that they wouldn't necessarily all have to be the same size in a actual subdivision, then you would have to have, you go back to the 100 foot. But I had a, a question. In a case where someone is, say, contiguous to the city limits and you're calculating that and there's actually no houses around anywhere, then do you take the average of zero and average that in with the um, actual numbers uh, of what would then be allowed based on the 10,000, uh, on the 15,000 square foot lots? So for what we've utilized thus far is for the unzoned areas, 2.9 units per acre, 
is both actual and allowable. So we reflect, basically let the, let the calculation reflect in both cases that it is possible because of 15,000 square foot lot size to have 2.9 units per acre. Because, and the rationale behind that, and again, this is a methodology for evaluating uh, our development application. The idea there is to give, give some conservative uh, uh, allowances when making the calculation because uh, you could have up to theoretically 2.9 units per acre for an unzoned parcel. So that's why we reflect that. And so you essentially get credit for having it actual and allowable. So you're not penalized in the process of, ca of calculating these densities. The, the applicant is not penalized by having one for zero, zero units per acre. Right. And, and just to be clear, as Buford said, in the unzoned areas, we're, what we're trying to find out is what is the typical, what is the density, what would it be? 10,500 square foot, 15,000 square foot lots, 100 foot lot widths, again, the maximum you could get in, in an unzoned area through our subregs is 2.9 units per acre, which is, which is where we, we get that number and plug it into the formula. My only concern on that is sometimes it's almost like a reverse penalization that somebody in a rural area that has a few houses would get a lot less density than somebody in a rural area that has absolutely no houses. And I question whether we should put some kind of a, when you talk about the 2.9, you really can't get 2.9 when you look in and take into account your uh, right of ways, your streets, your, you know, and, and right. your different infrastructure that it takes. So I question if we ought to put some kind of a factor in those areas that are 100% rural and you don't have anything to compare it to, if we ought to put, you know, rather than 2.9 per acre, 2 per acre or something like that and take into account because that land around there will never be 2.9 per acre unless you allow some type of a multifamily occupancy in there because you won't ever get that 2.9 density by the time you add the streets and the right of way and the infrastructure. So I question if maybe we should put some kind of a factor in there for the infrastructure. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll certainly look at that and, and we can, again, this is just a tool. Again, it's just, it's just a best planning practice. It's not a rule or regulation. Uh, we can, and Lee, we can take that into consideration and certainly look at that. I understand your point with that and that's, that's a good point. We can certainly look at it and, and, uh, and tweak it if necessary. I'm concerned in the development of the ETJ area. See, if you've got unzoned property, but you all have zoned it by requiring the lots to be 100 foot wide and certain size, forget the legality of that. Maybe it's legal, maybe it's not, but it doesn't seem reasonable. But I'd like to re express one more time when I came to you all about a year ago, stop zoning by width of lots. Just put a density out there, zone by density and use. Even in the ETJ, say you've got so many units per acre, y'all have been talking about 2.9, whatever the number is, so you've got this many units per acre. Let me as a developer decide what width of the lots they are. Because if I have a certain number of density, well, if I want to have smaller lots, well, that just gives me more green area that is going to be left over. And it serves a lot of different purposes. Sure. So I'm, again, requesting y'all get y'all quit zoning by width and sizes of lots and just go strictly by density, please. Just, just to make sure we're crystal clear, the, that, that rule has not been changed in three or four years, so I just want to make sure everybody knows that. We're, that's something that, that we can definitely look at, but, uh, uh, but uh, that's not something that we propose changing today. We, we'll certainly look at that and discuss that. What we had in our regs before was based before, on. Before, I mean, what, what, when was that, Nancy? Give um, some context what we're talking about. Gosh, Lee, how long? Well, yeah, so what, what, what it was based on before was if you had water when, only. Four years ago? Yes. Okay. If you had water only, it was a certain lot width. If you had water and sewer, it was another lot width. And so what was happening is we had a lot of people coming to us that did very small lot widths, as small as they could make it, then they would try to annex into the city. So our zoning map, and I, the one that comes to mind is maybe Saddlewood, or that they would come in and have created these little bitty lots and then want to be annexed so they wouldn't match our zoning designations, which was right. complicated okay. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the concern was is that we got a lot, yeah. Right, and I think mm -hmm. that we, the village subdivision does allow for some 
creativity mm -hmm. more so. So that is a, they do have some alternatives right. in there. So Good. perfect. Thank you. Uh, I just want to go back to the idea of the, uh, uh, this kind of a, a methodology is uh, promoting a sort of uh, continuity or a uniformity that kind of flies in the face of the ideas of mixed use and eclectic variety and the, and the healthiness that that kind of uh, uh, mixed uh, characteristics can bring to a community. Uh, uh, Fairhope is uh, famous, I think, for being a sort of an eclectic place with a great deal of variety and a great deal of freedom. Uh, this, this sort of pattern of development is going to lead to a sort of a monoculture uh, which may be unhealthy in its uniformity. I think, I think we're going to have to think about that very carefully because this is going to drive the creation of a larger uh, city in the future that's not going to be the kind of a place that Fairhope has been. Well, first let me say, I, I, when you talk about mixed use, there's a misnomer that mixed use is great everywhere. That's not, I, I think if you read some of the uh, planning literature and you go to some of the, the, the great cities and towns and counties, uh, you don't have this mixed use spotted everywhere. That's, that's not really the, the best practice when you talk about mixed use. The Fair Up Conference, Conference of Plan starting, I believe, in 2001 promoted mixed use. And that's a great thing. We promote mixed use but only at those areas, the village centers. If you, if you read the comp plan, if you read our zoning order, if you look at that, mixed use is, is, is encouraged, but only at those mixed use centers. And if uh, you can go to um, a lot of different places throughout the country and, and you see these areas, you don't have this hodgepodge of mixed use scattered throughout the land. You have those at key intersections, at key locations, at, in the downtowns, downtown areas and so forth. And so, uh, so I, you know, and. Uh, I, you t if you read the conference plan that we've had here for many, many years, 15, 16 years now, that concept has been, has been promoted, and again, it's the mixed use at these centers, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, if we allow mixed use everywhere else, you, you, you get a scattered, sprawling type development, which most people do not support, and then the mixed use centers become less important because you can do them anywhere. Um, and so I think that the, the path we've been on for 15 or 16 years, we want to we want to keep on that path and keep forward, keep going down this the, the mixed use approach, but only at the village centers. I think that's very important. Um, we support mixed use. We're not trying to create this this just typical blah development. But again, I think we have to focus on the long term goals. Planning is is, a, is an issue where. A lot of small decisions over a series of years equal a big, a bigger plan, a bigger development. You have to make sure that each each development we approve is consistent with that plan, with that that village center, that mixed use concept. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, obviously, we don't, you know, we don't want to see a, a sprawling community. When you have mixed use centers spread around, you've got utility issues, you've got transportation issues, and I don't think that that supports the again the vision that Fairfax has since 2001. Right, and and what, what what Lee is saying is is that this whole process is an attempt to bring some objectivity, some data, some analysis to these decisions, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, that's that's something that we feel very important. Uh, that's that's very important. So when people know when we make decisions, they can see how we're arriving at these conclusions. It's not whether we like it or not, or someone else doesn't like it or likes it. We're we're trying to make educated, uh, data-driven decisions, and that's what's very important to us. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Next topic, we'll move to, um, uh, I'll ask Buford to, to stay up here and talk about the uh, low impact development standards. We are discussing some potential changes to those and uh, I think this is something that uh, I think will be beneficial um, and I'll ask him to come up and start this presentation. So good afternoon again everyone. I'm going to verbalize, I'm going to verbalize this presentation and if you'll indulge me just a moment to pull up a website that we'll reference during our discussion. Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon again. At the, uh, on the table in the rear of the room, there is a document. And for the sake of simplicity, we decided to simply make available to everyone a hard copy. Um, and that document depicts the final sections of the subdivision regulations that involve the low impact development techniques. It's, an in, it's a lengthy section of the subdivision regulations that involve time of concentration calculations, a number of the technical aspects. What we want to discuss here today is simply quantities of low impact development techniques. Currently, as, uh, as it appears in the subdivision regulations right now, there are 15 LID techniques listed. The requirement for the developer is to utilize 10 of those. Invariably, many of the applications we receive for subdivisions include requests for waivers from the requirement of 10 LID techniques because the geography, size, shape, the size, shape, and geography, or, uh, or various other elements of a subject property don't allow the use of 10 LID, 10 LID techniques. So what we are proposing in requesting feedback from the development community is revisions to that, sub to that portion of the subdivision regulations where we maintain the requirement for LID techniques. I want to underscore that the purpose of the discussion is to absolutely maintain the LID techniques. However, our objective is to change it from more of an output based to an outcome based specification. The bottom line here is that we wish for the stormwater management system on a particular development to remove 80 percent of the total suspended solids of the stormwater. That is how it's accomplished. What we're proposing is the engineer of record for a particular development. They may utilize the LID technique or techniques that best fit the site. That may be one technique, that may be dozens of techniques and many combinations of techniques. Furthermore, we're going to reference, and, is, and this will be noted in, in the hard document, which you're all welcome to have. Um, if we run out of hard copies, I'm happy to email, uh, email it to anyone who'd like to see it as well. There's a web link in there, and it's referencing <coughs> what we formed, were, refer to informally as the Alabama LID technique, uh, the Alabama LID handbook. And it is a publication, it's a publication of the Cooperative Extension Service. And I actually have that portion of their website up here right now, and the reason being is it gives you some examples. So the, the handbook lists at least 20 combinations of LID techniques. We will reference this, incorporate it by reference into the LID to portion of the stormwater regulations, if so approved. The engineer of record can utilize any combination he or she feels is best to uh, fit the property. Anything from vegetated swales, rain gardens, there are references in here to curb cuts. Uh, what's unique and what's very interesting about, the do about that document is that it not only describes, it gives numerous photos with, uh, with in some places scaled and engineering drawings overlaid on, top of the, on, overlaid on top of photos, as well as sample calculations for their functionality. <laughs> So that is, our, that is our proposition, is to remove the requirement for 10 LIDs, maintain the requirement for LIDs, as we described previously. And that document is available for download for free. It's a lengthy document, well over 250 pages long, but provides that. But that's what we wish to do here today, is just underscore that it will be maintained for LID techniques, just modifying the volume of LID techniques in a particular development. And we're certainly welcome to entertain questions. And I may ask Mr. Richard Johnson to assist me here, because Richard is going to evaluate the uh, stormwater portion, portion of every, uh, of every uh, subdivision application that we receive. So with that, we'll certainly welcome questions. Good afternoon. Andy Bobby again with Dewberry. Um, with the LID techniques, I know it's becoming very common that most municipalities are requiring them, but I haven't found any yet they're going to take any over for maintenance. Is that still going to be the case in Fairhope? Is there ever going to be a chance where some of these things can be included in right of way versus in common area or anything of that nature? Our intention at this time is to not accept for maintenance anything in, in the right of way or not accept any, 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 uh, any of these structures or devices for maintenance. Okay. And, 
but we will st still need to include the information in the uh, operation maintenance plan on how to how to maintain them. That that's that's correct, Andy, and thank you for asking that. The, essentially, essentially, as we sit here today, and what we're contemplating, as uh, what we're contemplating as of right this moment, is essentially the first 25 to 30 pages of that section of the subdivision regulations will remain unchanged. The portion of the LID techniques is about the five final pages of that section. So everything preceding that will stay the same for now, but possible revisions in, in, at a later time. Um, I know since this is becoming more popular, there are certain manufacturers that are starting to have kind of an off-the-shelf LID that, that will fit. You can check a box that could go in the right-of-way. It's just like every, all the rest of them, it's going to be a higher maintenance item. Um, one of them that I've used is a, is a Filterra system. Uh, it's, it looks like an inlet. It's got a tree planted in the top. It's got filter media in it, uh, but every so often it requires maintenance. Um, the ones that I've used, we've had to put in common area, but they would go very nicely along the right-of-way or along the curb or gutter situation. Is there a potential that we could work some type of plan out to where that could be included and then maybe still have that be a maintenance item for POA? So. And, and I will tell you, I, I think the the world that we would all like to get to is that the, probably the, the most unfair thing that we do as a development team, whether it be the jurisdiction, it's the, the regulators or the design professionals or the developers, is we put all this thought and energy into a system and then eventually we move in a group of innocent homeowners who just want to enjoy life and then one day I send them a letter and say, hey, you've got this system you need to maintain. That's right. And let's face it, a group of property owners are not well equipped to be in the drainage maintenance business. The city does it every day through public works. I would like to say that one day we get to a point where we treat a drainage system just like we treat a road. There's a way to make a public dedication and an acceptance and there's a mechanism that we have the ability to maintain it in good working order as designed and as built. We're not there yeah. yet, right. I, I think that we, we've got to start thinking in those terms. So to say absolutely not, not ever, can't happen, I, I don't think that way. I think of a way that there's, there's got to be a series of mechanisms that we go through because ultimately our citizens are paying the property taxes, they are paying the sales taxes, and that should be a service that we're rendering to them because we're equipped to do it and they're not. Um, so I, I'm not saying that not now, not ever, and we'll look at it case by case, but the, the, the biggest thing is, is that that's going to require a comfort level with our elected officials, that we can take on that responsibility and, and, and do it and do it well, and I'm not sure we're there yet. In, in that same, same token, and this is a little tricky, but um, if Fairhope were to develop a site for a new structure, building, whatnot, y'all would have to implement the same items. Is that correct? The same LID? Well, I, I had a little presentation here with not quite as great of a crowd last sure. night. And one of the things that I stated in Public Works is that we had to start practicing what we're preaching and that as we go about Public Works projects, we need to be incorporating the same standards, the same level of care for LID, uh, low impact. Uh, you know, if we say you're supposed to use concrete pipe in this application, then by golly, we should be using concrete pipe in the same application. Is that written in stone anywhere? No, but that's Richard Johnson's position and that's how we're going to operate. And I only ask that question is because I'd like to at some point get some collaboration going on what what that level of maintenance is going to be regarding some of these techniques because I think some of them are going to be a matter of opinion whether they're functioning or not uh, and that's ultimately where I'm trying to get to is at establishing that that point failure point some of them will be obvious that that water's bypassing it but uh, some of them will be they won't be able to handle the the rain of it that we get uh, they'll exceed the design of, um, for the 
particular LID technique. That's generally I didn't didn't prepare well enough to ask some of these questions, but that's kind of generally where I'm trying to go is that at some point we can establish certain points at that we can come to an agreement that maybe one day these can be incorporated into public spaces and essentially maintenance on them. But uh, I'll try and get that more tactfully worded and shoot it to you. Thank you. This, uh, Andy hit on something on the last meeting we had on the LID. I think Lee was involved with I know he was here this same subject came up about you know what we what the city was trying to encourage was LID in the rights ways rather than to do the standard curb and gutter storm drainage and all that and and, and I think it's a, a good method and but it comes to maintenance when we do a subdivision plat we plat we plat it and hand over the right, uh, dedicate the rights ways to the city. So that's the city's property. What needs to be looked at, if you do, if you don't, if you don't maintain it, then somebody has had the legal right to do the maintenance work within the right of way. And, you know, that's going to be complicated. Um, I don't know the answer, but it, it, it's just a lot of thinking that needs to be behind this, and the city needs to make the decision to tell us how you want to develop this plan. Are you or are you not going to maintain it? If not, that needs to be covered legally somehow between the city and the HOA, I guess, because they're going to be working on your property or the public property. And usually when that happens, damage may occur. Do they have to have bonds or whatever? So there's a lot of stuff that can go in to this type of situation or maybe not require or prohibit low impact in the rights way, make, make everybody do it in private areas. So with that, that's, that's my biggest concern. And I think part of the self-realization on what we've just discussed about saying that there is, a, it's problematic that we, we put up a list of, of methodologies and then say you have to use X number of the mm -hmm. list. If one of these design professionals absolutely was able to check all 10 boxes, that could mean in a, in a relatively small development there was 10 unique facilities that the future owners would have to maintain that may require t 10 different processes to maintain them. Mm -hmm. But what if these design professionals could build one system that achieves the outcome, because we're talking about the, the performance, what comes out of the pipe has to perform the same whether there's one LID methodology or 25. But if we now only have one facility of unique systems and traits about it, that does hopefully lessen the burden on those future maintainers, owners, because it's easier to maintain a singular, single type function facility than 10 dissimilar different function type facilities. So hopefully that will help that. As far as the right of way here, uh, I, I've dealt with one case where it was, it was a pretty intrusive LID feature. It was very large. It was very linear. It, 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 was, it had the potential that after the folks bought their homes and moved in, they would be calling their city council member to get it filled or covered up or removed. And, you know, my judgment call there is that that, 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 it, it, that feature did not enhance the streetscape where it was proposed and, 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 and it had a potential for uh, a heavy potential for a heavy maintenance requirement. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to tell you guys how to design your subdivision, but we do reserve the right to tell you what we what we will uh, be what our level of of, of 
burden we'll bear within the in the right of way for future potential ma maintenance or even a nuisance that could be considered a nuisance sometime in the future in that right of way. I think we do have a precedent set where there are some small infiltration swells that look like hidden landscape areas that are very attractive and we had some mechanisms to uh, tie the POA and the future owners to the maintenance of those. Uh, it, it, it's, it's yet to be seen how well that survives over time and how that relation uh, and something like that, I, I don't think it's problematic for them to come into the right-of-way and work because we, we issue permission to work in the right-of-way to multiple agencies, contractors, groups, et cetera, et cetera, on a daily basis. But I understand what you're saying. Sometimes the logical location, the functional location turns out to be the right-of-way and that we've got to look at a mechanism that there's a, at least a, a happy median that that can be accomplished. Only thing I, I'm requesting is that whatever the decision, uh, we'll follow the rules, but let's make sure we all understand the rules, how they apply, and make it clear to everyone enough to make the decisions how to do this. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. Kathy Barnett, Dewberry. Um, just a question. So not all of the low impact design are engineered solutions. There's also the preservation of vegetation and non-engineered vegetative swells. Is there um, any concern about utilizing those lid techniques as long as we can prove the percent pollutant reduction and the green space requirements that are already part of the ordinance? Or has that been considered or are we worried about that at all? And I don't know the answer to this. Does, the, does an LID technique that has a green component, can it double count as open space as well as LID? I do not know the answer to that question. I, I would propose that it could. Um, whereas if it was a traditional retention pond, I think we tell, tell you that the, the water surface area is not green space because it's really kind of hard to enjoy actively. But, but I would tell you that. Those are all the things that we're here for today to talk about, and that's something we'll go back amongst the staff and talk about um, and come up, like I said, come up with a solution, and John's exactly right. Uh, once we land on an area we think will work, we want to definitely make sure we communicate that to everybody, and we may even, I would even consider even holding another workshop just on the LID techniques and to make sure everybody understands those so we have a good dialogue. Once we do settle on a particular uh, way of doing this, that we uh, take comments and ensure that everybody knows what we're doing and make sure we didn't overlook something, something or have a conflict somewhere. Uh, the, bu the business of uh, measuring the outcome, uh, could you paint a picture for us uh, that tells us sort of how these outcomes are going to be measured and monitored, especially over the long term, and how we're going to fit that in with uh, measuring and monitoring the pollutant load that we're delivering to some targets like Mobile Bay. And Mr. Gover, that's, that's kind of what Mr. Bobby had brought up is that some of the LID methodologies, if left to their own devices over time, may become less and less effective. Um, uh, and, and that is a challenge uh, in this sense is that the design engineer can do the calculations and there is, uh, the, there is pretty good science out there that you can base sizing of different things on to get a particular outcome knowing what your inflow is and things of that nature. And the contractor can do a spot on job of building it and hit all his elevations and all his grades and set everything correctly and then we jump 20 years ahead. We don't have an answer for that. Uh, we do have individuals uh, who are volunteers who, who do turbidity readings and things like that. And when we have spikes in uh, discoloration of streams and flows, we know we're losing sediment uh, and, uh, and, and it's, in, it's in the runoff. And then we do have people like Kim who go looking for the sourcing of that. And, you know, if we come back to a facility that apparently is now allowing those suspended solvents to move within the discharge, we, we can deduce that we're not, we're not performing like it should be. How to quantify that down to whether is it only removing 25 percent or is it removing 55 percent, that, that's a tough one. And in our operation and maintenance agreement, 
that we have that runs with the land and the design professionals when they when they complete the construction of the development they prepare a document that is basically the care and feeding of the stormwater system which includes the LID uh, techniques that are incorporated in that design and in that document it's a legal document that gets recorded and it runs with the land there's a disconnect because one day the people who developed it and designed it have walked away because they did their part and did it well and now it is occupied and owned by a bunch of dissimilar individuals who have found their way to live in a community in Fairhope and again they may not know the existence of that document they may not be equipped as a group to handle the requirements of that document because that document implies that they have to bring a design professional back in on a reoccurring interval and reevaluate to make sure it's operating in as built and as designed condition. And that looks wonderful on paper, but here's the problem. I've got a group of happy homeowners out in subdivision whatever in, in Fairhope, Alabama, and life is good, okay? And all of a sudden, they get that letter from Richard Johnson saying, hey, we haven't had an update on your inspection and things of that nature. If they refuse to do anything, we really are limited in what we can do other than beg, cajole, send letters, ask nicely, please. And then what we've been doing is we are doing with our staff some inspections and then trying to go meet with the POA and say, well, if you get this landscape company to come here and here and, and get the sediment out of your pond and cut down the popcorn trees, you know, that's going to make things better. It's a wonderful thing in the regulations. It's a wonderful document that has a lot of teeth. And I will tell you, I recently had a PO, POA president on the phone. She was very nicely, but she told me where I could put that document. Okay. <laughs> that was the truth. And you know, I don't know what to do at that point in time because I do not think my mayor and city council is going to be real excited if I need to tell them that they need to go lay the hammer down on 126 to 252 registered voters. Uh, that's the reality. Um, but we are we're trying hard. And then I've had three POA presidents I've met in the field. They've gotten people out and they fixed the problem and they were glad to do it. So three out of four ain't bad. If we go just if we go just to the uh, percentage, then we're going to miss some opportunities in terms of creative design for saving habitat and some one area that we did a wilderness area where they circled um, or saved some trees, but they have roads all around it. Well, then that negates the possibility for some habit good creative habitat conservation. So we may want to think about incentivizing and. Um, Anyway, so that that's a and also the other thing that what Richard was talking about, we do have it written in our regs that we can enforce on those O and M plans. So there is an enforcement. Okay, great. Yeah, I've got one more time for one more question. We're getting a little behind schedule, but go ahead. Uh, I'll make it quick. Um, regarding the retention ponds and what y'all said about not being able to use them for recreational, I can understand the retention pond the size of this room not having much recreational benefit, but once you get up to five acres or greater there is recreational benefit and what I'm working on a development now and considering a large lake and um, and the regulation says well it's so I can use part of it as retention but if I want to increase the size of the retention pond to, to create a recreational lake you're telling me I can't do it y'all need to reword rework some of that and allow because I just use it if I had a 20 acre lake and only needed five or six acres for retention there's no reason I shouldn't be able to use that as open space you can canoe in it you can fish and all that stuff so please re reconsider that all right thank you all right let's move on to uh, number four on the agenda it's a discussion about subdivision bonds and sidewalks and I'll ask Richard Johnson public works director to come up and handle this topic and and I do want to preface I know Jason designed a neighborhood out in the Bell Forest area called Canaan Place that has a six acre lake in it last time I drove by it there was two kids out there fishing so I I do recognize that a, a part of a, uh, a stormwater management system can be quite a neat amenity to a neighborhood so I, I agree with you I, I mean I think if it's a 
you know, a 20 by 20 pond, you would have a hard sale there. But if you've got, you know, several acres uh, of, of, of lake that can have fishing and kayaking and, and those that I think there, there should be some passive and rec active recreation value assigned to it. I do want to preface this. I'm, I'm going to go kind of quickly because this is, this is one of these issues. It's, it, it's probably for our design professionals and our contractors and their developers and for city staff, one of the just toughest most aggravating issues that we're we're dealing with in in subdivision regulations just for those that are, are not in the trade or in the business uh, a bond which we use that word is just uh, is a guarantee that something is going to be taken care of financially if it needs to be taken care of in the future for a defined period of time for us, it's an insurance policy to make sure that when we accept a subdivision, at whatever stage in the future, everything is complete, everything is correct. If it's not, we can waive that surety instrument and whoever's name on it has to perform or they, they have an ability to have a financial disincentive through that, that surety. Here's what the issue is. The maintenance bond is not a problem. When we have improvements that are going to become public infrastructure, uh, infrastructure in a subdivision development, we ask for a two-year warranty, meaning that a bond is placed on the percentage of the value of the improvements for what we're accepting. And in the case of what do we accept, the public utilities that are, that are controlled uh, and under the jurisdiction of our utilities, as well as the public infrastructure within the public rights of ways. That's the roads, the sidewalks, the curb, the gutter, the drainage that's in that, that, that footprint. And we ask for a two-year warranty period. That's not going to change. The issue is sidewalks, street trees, and the performance bonds that go along with that. And here is the, the three issues with sidewalks that I want to dwell into. And, and I want you to put your thinking cap on because we haven't made any hard decisions. We're discussing a way to solve the three problems that, that we are dealing with in sidewalks. The first one, Mr. Turner put this up and it's his frustration, is an incomplete network. Our home builders do not build in a logical order. If you've never noticed that, they will build one house in the front of the neighborhood and then they'll go to the back of the neighborhood and then they'll go to the middle and they'll jump around. And all of a sudden you got half of the home lots in the subdivision developed and the, and the nice families there will walk for a few houses and have to step in the road and walk down and get back on the sidewalk. So the incomplete network is a big thing. Now right now, the, tree, uh, the, 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 the houses are coming out of the ground like, like spring weeds, uh, but we know that that comes and goes and slows up and speeds down. The other issue is, coming back to the home builder, we have burdened whoever bonded the improvements, whether it be the developer, <coughs> developer's contractors, or God forbid the developer's engineers, whoever holds the bond for those sidewalks that were going to be built at the time of home construction. Well, what happens is we go out to inspect and release those bonds and we encountered sidewalks that are damaged. Now we all know that whoever holds the bond didn't damage the sidewalks. It's pretty much pretty assured that the home builder who backed the concrete truck right up, because you can see the ruts on each side of it, damaged the sidewalks. But we don't have an ability to hold that home builder necessarily uh, 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 responsible. We hold the bondholder. And it is unfair, but that's our only mechanism to make sure that sidewalk is in, in correct order. But the biggest issue that we're seeing today is our design professionals, when they design the subdivision, they lay out the sidewalks, they do typical details for cross sections, for ADA ramps, all the things they have to do, they do it correctly, and, and they'll add a note that these, these meet the current ADA federal requirements for, for cross slopes and everything that goes along with that. And then the design professional, the final plat comes to the planning commission and he's signed off a certification of improvements and he's happy, he's done a good job, the contractor's done a good job, and then, then the plat is recorded, the lots are sold, and the home builders build the sidewalks. Well, the reality of it is there may be a minimal chance that the home builder has ever seen the design professional's design for the sidewalk system. And he's going to start, hopefully, if there's a house to his right, he'll start there. And if there's a house to his left, he'll tie in there. And it may or may not be the correct distance from the back of the curb. And there's a good chance the cross slope and things like that may not meet the ADA compliance. 
So what we're finding out is that we have a lot of brand new sidewalks and a lot of neighborhoods that do not meet ADA compliance. And it's bad enough that as a public works director, we're trying to retrofit all the old existing sidewalks in those parts of town that were built before there was ever an ADA regulations, while at the same time we're getting brand new product that doesn't, doesn't meet that regulation as well. Uh, Richard, can I jump in real quick? This guy messes outside a minute ago. If anybody's driving a white Denali, you have someone blocked in. So if you're driving a white Denali, you've got somebody blocked in. So don't know. Truck. White Denali, yeah. Truck. So, thank you. Sorry, Richard. I, I got called outside a minute ago. So, it's, so. It, it's figured. It's John. I, I, I would have guessed. Um, so, our first thought is that it's that we need to make sure that the design professional's design gets constructed, that the de design professional can inspect what was constructed so that if he's signing his name to it, he knows it was built per his design, and that we have at least one day of one minute of one hour that we know the sidewalk network in that subdivision phase is complete and is ADA compliant. So what we're, we are thinking, and I, and, and I want our developers, and you don't have to respond today because we haven't written any language, we haven't taken any positive mood, we're going to have a discussion with our planning commission because they've already kind of brought it up too, is we are at the point where we feel that all sidewalks have to be in, constructed and in place before the final plat is recorded. And the design professional can do a certificate of improvements that includes an ADA statement so that we at least know that at one point in time that all is there. On the other side of that, we've already sat down with our chief building official. He's bought all of his inspectors levels that have digital scales on them, and he's been teaching them ADA compliance. And before a new home can get a CO, a certificate of occupancy, that his inspectors are going to inspect the sidewalks and the curb line on the frontage of that new house, plus or minus some distance to be determined to make sure that if they back the truck over the corner of the lot and took out the sidewalk on the neighbors, that we will not issue the CO until those sidewalks are rebuilt if they're damaged to the, to the same standard that they were when, when the home builder started. What does that do for, um, for us on the back end? It makes it a lot cleaner because you're not chasing bonds. We're not constantly renewing, because what happens right now is we get a year down the road, 50% of the lots are built, then the developer, whoever's holding the bond, reduces it by half, and, and we just keep going on and on and on. So that, that, is, that is the initial response, because if at least we do though that in that order, we resolve the three problems I listed, and that is we have a complete network for the first family that moves in there, the, develop, the, the bondholder is not getting the burden of damage, and we at least know that for one day we had ADA compliance. Uh, the second issue is the street trees. What we do is we require a street tree planting program within our subdivision. Uh, well, it's a standalone tree ordinance, but we, 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 we apply it at the time of subdivision, preliminary approval, and final approval. But again, our home builders. Uh, like to, uh, or our developers like to put the street trees in when after the home gets built, and there's there's logic behind that, and we're we're trying to debate how we we skin that one, and is that go ahead and have the trees put in at final plat, and uh, and and then have uh, the the same performance bond on the two year warranty apply to those trees so that in two years either it's alive or it's not or it's there or it's not and that we stop having the separate performance bond for street trees and then again can tie the CO to at least a cursory review if the street tree is there at that time or not haven't completely thought that one through the other issue is and this is to, to get your head around it for those that are not familiar, we have the city of Fairhope, which is inside the city limits. All rules apply, zoning, subdivision, police jurisdiction. Then we have a police jurisdiction, which is bigger than the city limits, but smaller than the planning jurisdiction. And in that jurisdiction, zoning doesn't apply, but our building code applies, 
and certain ordinances such as the tree ordinance and things of that nature. And then we have the planning jurisdiction, which is the biggest of all, which our subdivision regulations alone apply, and we have kind of sort of attached the tree ordinance to that. And we're doing a little discussion with the city attorneys and things like that, because understand, here's the complexity. Those roads that are being created in our police jurisdiction and in our planning jurisdiction are not being accepted by us. If they're going to be public roads, they're being accepted by the county. And right now, we're requiring developers or some entity in that development process to put a, a performance bond to plant a tree sometime in the future in a roadway that's not under the jurisdiction of the city of Fairhope that the Baldwin County may not want there in the first place. And it's their road to maintain. If the tree gets planted when the subdivision is complete, it's there, it's measurable, it can be encompassed. We're weighing all this through. Want your input? I love street trees. I think trees enhance lots. I think a house with a nice tree in front of it is more valuable than the same house without any trees around it. But it's, it's a process and it's a managerial thing. And I guarantee you we could get folks to stand up and give testimonials about the aggravation of trying to get a bond cleared and released because it just becomes a nightmare and Nancy Milford lives it just about every day. And, you know, it is ridiculous that, you know, that, that, that we spend as much time as we do, and I think you think it's ridiculous that we spend as much time as we do, but on the surety process, we do want to look at a way that accomplishes the goal, what we, what we want to see in, in development within our, in our jurisdiction, but do it in a way that's logical and that takes a lot of the unnecessary burden not only off of you as developers and design professionals but again so that we're not not chasing our tail so that that is that's kind of the 30,000 view it's more about the, the biggest thing is about our sidewalk system and I, I think that I answered Mr. Turner in an open meeting that I didn't think there was a good answer and I have been thinking and I talked to some folks in the county and the, the thing that amazed me is they said the same thing that they're running into ADA compliance issues and they're rethinking their position and that made me feel better and 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 that's my dial went from maybe neutral to leaning this way to where I'm, I'm over here thinking that you know it's probably time to put the sidewalks in at final plat so that we know we're, that everybody can at least on that day say we've done it it's correct let's move on be glad to answer any questions yeah, I, things I, are happening Wayne's got some great vision I, I really like the idea I had this conversation about reducing parking lot sizes and stuff that mm -hmm. y'all are looking at I mean these this awesome ideas I got to get used to be for compatibility but all right we're good <laughs> thank you John and, and yeah and we, we do want to try to make it easy for everybody we want to make the process easy for everybody and 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 i believe the, the the sewer system belongs in the middle of the street for the most part and we you know the technology is available now to maintain and access most of it you know from uh camera <coughs> access or, or repair access so i i think if and, and we're looking some of the standards we're talking about now just to and we are looking at c900 water pipe we there's a little section of of, of water mains that were laid on 181 they call band-aid alley it's just it's got more repairs in it than it has pipe and county road one's another example where perhaps water hammer gets away you know from us on occasion and and we have problems there so we, we want to you know work to try to eliminate those kind of problems and and the, the quality of pipe is going to be a part of that you know i don't i don't know that the force main work will be c900 it'll probably be class 200 but you get the, the gist of what I'm trying to accomplish, and, and, and I think everybody would be uh, open to all those changes. So, anyway, any, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please. Richard, it's, it's more along the lines of, uh, it was several months ago that, um, that it was brought to our attention about lift stations being over capacity and the concern with that. Where do you see us going with the repairs of that or 
or updating our technology so that when we are on the planning commission and the new developments come that that's not a concern for us right and today you know the capacity upgrades I think have started. We've, we've got an RFQ out in most consulting, except for the little last little thing about gas managers being notified. We're, that was from the first RFQ. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, we, we, we've got the, the first series of projects put together, and, and what I don't want to do is, is upgrade a, a, a lift station, South Section Street, for example, or a dog house or Thompson Hall. And then all of a sudden realize that, well, you know what, that, that gravity line that is on Church Street that takes that flow to the plant now has a manhole that overflows every time the lift station comes on. So we, we need to make sure that we get the transmission capability to the plant before we start upgrading lift stations. But, but having said all that, we hope to have uh, some consultants in place within by the end of April. We hope to have these projects defined and, and looked at perhaps by July or August. And as soon as we start getting those projects underway, we're going to back up and start looking at where these capacity issues need to be improved at the next layer. I mean, it'll be, you know, the next, uh, you know, radius away from the plant that we'll be starting to upgrade. And there'll be lift stations on the east side of town. And, and we'll do a combination of lift station upgrades and we'll do a combination of force main increased uh, capacity to bypass some of those lift stations so they don't have to be upgraded. They can go back to the, the working with the design that they were intended you know, to provide. And so that's part of what the scheme will be is to look at the system as we move our way out to try to make the most efficient and, and best use of what we do to upgrade it. Okay, perfect. I appreciate it. Thank you all for getting this together. Thank you. All right. And the last thing on our agenda is the construction standards. I'll ask Richard Johnson to come back up again and, uh, and uh, go over that. One of the things that the, kind of the team uh, that between planning and zoning, building department, utilities, and, and public works is that we, we don't want to spend a long time returning to and, 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 and continuing to update. And, and one of the, the goals in any correction or revisions or updates to the subdivision regulations is to make sure that we have a modern, currently appropriate construction standard. Um, and for those who want to know is, is, is that it's, it's how you build things. What is the, the minimum specifications that are, are desired in constructing some form of infrastructure? and. Um, and, and what we envision is that the subdivision regulations will reference a construction standard that can be updated. For example, we tend to reference things in other books like ALDOT for their, their asphalt design. Well, years ago it was, what, 416, and then when it went to 429, and then it's now 424. Well, basically it's all the same type of asphalt. It's apparently ALDOT, when they update their book, whatever section and chapter, that becomes the number. So if they add something before it, the number gets bigger. If they take something out, the number gets smaller. Well, that's just one of those things, if you, if you reference a construction standard, and then that standard says you will use the current wearing uh, uh, specification from the ALDOT uh, for asphalt, then it never gets out of date. But the biggest issue is, is looking from input from you on best practices, what is the current technology, how we need to be building things. And, and my example is, is the county uh, have gone back to residential road construction where they will allow a road with a single pass of asphalt, a wearing of two inches in thickness, uh, and, uh, and there is a cost savings to the developer and the contractor in this sense um, is if we have a binder course, which is a, a sub layer, and then we put a finish layer on it, that means a construction crew has to pass over it twice to complete the road. Well, technology and equipment and formulation of asphalt has got to the point where you can get a very good road section that will perform equally as well by a one pass methodology. That's one of those things that, that I want to revisit. I want input. 
And, and I think we qualify that, meaning that if you're going to go to a singular builder build up layer of asphalt, there's a geotechnical report that says that if you know if you prepare the base in this way, then this will perform and, and meet those those standards. Um, we don't need to tell you if, if 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 our land use desires for streets and residential subdivision to have curb and gutter or curb curb curbing, um, we don't need to tell you what type of curve that needs to be. You as the designer and you as the developer can pick that because there are multiple types of curbing that will all serve the purpose to, to give that protection uh, to the, the shoulder as well as convey the stormwater. What we need to be able to say is that it shall be, uh, you know, a curb is required, it shall be concrete, it shall be at least a 3,000 PSI, and we may say it shall not be any narrower than 24 inches, okay? Then if you're a developer that likes to use a 30 inch curb, hey, great, you want to do it, you know, or it may be 18 inches, we set that as a minimum standard. So I'm gonna be looking for feedback there. We, we wanna have a, a, a real, we, where you as a design professional and you as a developer can kind of read down and, and be able to know what is involved in constructing uh, your development. Um, and, and having some clear, concise construction standards that as other things update, it can just update with it, will make life uh, better on all of us. Subdivision regulations will refer to that as a, as a, as a uh, companion document and, and go from there. And I think that's the, the big thing is, is, is that we feel that these land uses need to, to inform you what the expected outcome is and allow you to use your creativity as design professionals, as developers, to achieve that outcome. And I think that's where we're trying to get to. And we're going to need a lot of input and, and, and go from there because I, I don't have the perfect answer. Um, but uh, uh, we do want to make that a goal this year that as we put, put that doc, document together, that we share it with you, get your input. And, it, and, and for all reasons, if you worked in another area and you found a great construction standard documentation, please uh, pilfer it and send it to me because there is no such thing as brand new ideas. It's just barring other people's great ideas. And uh, uh, be glad to entertain any questions concerning that. And, and if you have any particular issue with development in Fairhope today from a constructability standpoint, you know, love to, to, to hear that feedback as well. Just want to make just a few few remarks before we close. I, I think you've heard tonight. We we want to work together. Uh, we want the best for Fairhope. We want to see the best practices, the best best development techniques. So we're very open to that. I want to make make it that very clear that you know these regulations are not just static and they last for 30 years. Things do change. Technology does change. Design concepts change. We want to be we want to be open to those. And I, I think that the staff here today, our staff very competent, very qualified. We're, we're always willing to discuss those. We'll have more of these meetings to get feedback and have dialogue with, 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 with everyone about those concepts and those techniques. Um, one thing I want to mention before we go, and we've had some developers take advantage of this, but anytime you are considering a development, we would highly encourage a meeting, a pre-application meeting with us. We will uh, ensure that we put together the, our team uh, from the staff, county, from the city staff there. Um, we'll have all the people who will be affected, utilities, public works, planning. Uh, if there's trees, we'll have someone there, you know, who's, who specializes in the tree ordinance and so forth. But we want to work with you in the beginning so we can avoid any kind of problems and we can communicate to you what the expectations are, what the rules are. So we highly encourage that. So please call us if you have a project. We would love to meet with you. We can do some, if you give us some information ahead of time, we can do some cursory review of your applications. So when you do submit, it will be a, a very uh, smooth process and, and all the feedback you can get up front. So as you start designing the project, you know what the concerns are, you know what the regulations are. Uh, so uh, with that, we'll conclude. Uh, again, we'll probably have another one of these. We mentioned the LID, maybe having a workshop just for LID. So that may be coming in the future as well as other standards that we may uh, consider changing once we get some things put together that are, that are very solid and we're, we all feel comfortable with. We'll, we'll, act, we'll call a workshop and, and invite you back. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.